Hello everybody. God bless you. God bless you all. The Lord is good. He is, as we saw in Nahum 1 and 7, he is a stronghold in a day of trouble and he knows them that trust in him. We've been in a book of Nahum and that's a verse in the first chapter of Nahum that stands out. Um, we have certain verses and even unfamiliar passages of scripture, but they really ring out to us. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so we just thank God for all of you coming in tonight. Come on, let's pray and jump right into the word of the Lord in Nahum. I trust that you found it uh, from our last time together. He says, okay, there it was, where it is. And that you turn to that right quickly now. And let's pray and seek the Lord's guidance as we study this book together. Father, thank you. Praise you and honor you because of who you are. We recognize you as the almighty God. We thank you, God, because you not only love us, but you judge all unrighteousness. And we thank you that if we have seen during this study that you in no wise equip, acquit the guilty, but you will make sin punishable. But thank you that you paid the punishment. That you took upon yourself the cost you said the wages of sin is death. And so you died for our sin. Oh, we are so grateful to have accepted the payment that you made. So we come together again tonight to look into your wonderful word. We ask, oh God, that you would open our eyes that we might behold wondrous things out of your word. Sanctify your word in our hearts. You've promised us that it never returns to you void, but it always accomplishes what you send it forth to accomplish, and your word always prospers in the thing whereto you sent it. So thank you for the prosperity of your word tonight in the hearts of all of these that will come and listen. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So glad that we are able to come back together again. Oh, I don't know what that is. Even on tonight, he's a good God, and he is worthy to be praised. We've been in this book of Nahum. We've just started this new study in Nahum, and I've told you before, the desire of my heart is to take these books of the Bible that seem to me are less read um, by many, less notable, I'm going to go back and see what the Lord says. Because as we have said often, all of the word of God is given for uh, our example. He said all scripture is given and it is profitable. It's profitable for, for instruction and in righteousness, for uh, doctrine, for reproof, uh, for correction, for instruction and in righteousness that the man of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good work. So all of God's word is good for us. And when we look back and we begin, you know, the Old Testament can be a little bit, dare I say, scary, because we see the hand of God a lot in judgment. Oh, definitely, we see the love of God. Definitely, we see Jesus uh, in every book. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, Or Roberts preached a sermon about the fourth man. Oh my goodness. And he took us through every book of the Bible and showed us Jesus. It's a sermon I'll never forget. He was talking about the fourth man in the furnace, but he showed us who was this fourth man. It let me tell you something. I was much younger then. I know that's what well, Roberts has been going on to be with the Lord for a long time. And this is a sermon he preached <clears throat> a good while before he departed. And yet I still remember this sermon because it blessed me. You know, the word of God is like that. <laughs> you read it. And sometimes there's certain parts of it that did something to you 
and you will always remember it. Certain scriptures that come to you and you'll always remember. I can't think of Nahum 1-7 and not think of Deacon Furby. It's, it's a, <laughs> when you see Nahum 1-7, you see his face. Praise the Lord. And there's scriptures that are like that. There's certain people, I guess because they said it so much or you learned it from them. And to every time you read it, oh God, you remember that individual person. That's just part of the goodie of the word of God, the things that God gives to us. Come on, let's go into Nahum. As we looked at Nahum, we see that Nahum um, is contemporary. I was reading uh, this morning in Isaiah, and uh, Nahum was a contemporary of Isaiah. And I shared with you last time about Hezekiah and Sennacherib. And you'll find that account also recorded in Isaiah around 30, 31, something like that. And you see how all of the word of God comes together. I don't know if you've noticed it, but it's just one continuous story. When I say story, don't, don't, don't think that I mean something not true, but it's one continuous uh, story of the people of God, how things got started and what happened after that. And what's happening even now and what will happen in the future. The word of God, and I say even now, the word of God is complete. But it covers this whole church era. This whole era of the church. And shows us that the Lord is going to return. Um, if you believe in dispensations, there's different dispensations in the word of God. And as we look at Nahum... We find we're still under the law that Jesus has not come in the flesh yet at the time Nahum has been writing, but the kingdom has been established and Hezekiah is king and God has chosen to judge the nations, not just individuals, but the nations of people as a whole. He established Israel as a nation so that he could work through them. They would be his poster child. Um, but when they did wrong, God would punish them. When others did wrong, God would use Israel to punish them. He, God has this whole thing <laughs> in control. I prayed to him this morning. I said, God, I'm so grateful that you got it all in control. It's a song... Um, that I've heard some time ago. It says, God got it all in control. I can't remember the name of the young lady who sang it now. It'll come to me later. She said, but God's got it all in control. She says, and he has put this reassurance way down in my soul. He's got it all in control. You know, that's why we don't worry and get upset. Because God has it in control. And so we saw that it has been a hundred years has passed since a hundred, a hundred and fifty, something like that, since uh, Jonah had preached to the Assyrian nation, the capital city of Nineveh, and had warned them. And we see that at that time, Nineveh repented. But now here in Nahum, we see that Nineveh has, in that century, returned back to his old ways. And it made us, the application, uh, something we get from that is how often God forgives us. We repent and God forgives us and we go right back to our old ways. We use that example of 9-11 where America was concerned. And we see here that the name Nahum himself means consolation or comfort. But yet, when we read Nahum, and you see all of you say, how in the world is this comforting? And we see as we go through Nahum, the comfort is for the people of God to know and understand that even though things are happening around you that seem to be adverse to you, God says, take comfort. Uh, because I know what I'm allowing 
what I'm doing, and the outcome. Did y'all hear me? Whatever is going on in your life right now, God is saying to you, be comforted in the fact that I know what I allow to happen to you, what I'm doing in and through, even to you, and I know the outcome. You're going through a phase right now. And God is saying to you, nothing can happen without my knowledge. I see everything that you're going through. I hear everything they're saying. And I know the outcome of it. Oh, brother, sister, friend, you can trust God. God knows how this story is going to end. I understand that, you know, some people don't believe we're in a pandemic. But God says, I know the end. And if you just stay with me, if you just hold on to me, if you would just trust me, I know the end of the story. And I'm going to bring you, oh God, I feel you, to a successful end. Ah, I can talk to myself right here. Do you mind if I just encourage myself? If I just talk to myself and say to myself, God, I'm grateful that you know exactly what I'm going through. And you know the end so Bethany, just relax, trust me, depend on me, I got away. You know, I kind of want to, I kind of feel that I can go back to Isaiah. I was in Isaiah, I told you I was in Isaiah this morning, and it so happens that it applies right here to Nahum, and if you don't mind, I want to go through, I want to go back. Um, I didn't know I was going to do this, but I tell you, sometimes when I'm teaching, even though I prepare, sometimes I feel as though the Lord steps in and he, he gives me something to share with you. And so I'm going to pick up, because I told you Isaiah was a contemporary of Nahum. So I want to pick up a little bit and share some things with you that I saw here um, while I was reading in Isaiah, um, and this is what he says in Isaiah 31, verse 8. He says, Assyria will fall by no human sword. A sword not of mortals will devour them. They will flee before the sword, and their young men will be put to forced labor. Their stronghold will fall because of terror. At the sight of the battle standard, their commanders will panic, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion, whose furnace is in Jerusalem. God is saying, don't worry about it. I got Assyria. Those who are threatening you, he is letting them know, I'm going to take care of them. He said, they will fall. And I want to share with you the things that are coming up against you. And you know that you have put your faith and your trust in God. The enemy that's coming up against you, they're going to fall. Remember when Egypt was uh, following the children of Israel and the Lord said to them, the enemy you see today, you will never see again. Mm. The problem that seems so overwhelming to you today, I'm talking to somebody God is saying, I'm going to take care of it. And when I cast it down and when I destroy it, it'll never rise up again. God is on your side. When your faith and your trust is in him and your heart is right before God and your motives before God are right and folks are coming against you and things are coming up against you, you just got to know in whom you trust. 
Where is your faith? The songwriter said, where is your faith in God? You stand strong. And you be encouraged. Here's some of the things we can learn out of Nahum. Because his name, I said to you, means consolation or comfort. And sometimes people think that because uh, God is just, that maybe he's uh, cruel, but God's not cruel. He's a comforting God. Nahum taught that the Lord is a jealous God. Look at verse 2. Nahum chapter 1 and verse 2. And he talks about God being a jealous God. How many times in scripture have we seen that God is jealous? Now, when we think about jealousy, we think in a negative term. We think about jealousy as uh, ourselves, something that we want that someone else has or something on that nature. It's, it's kind of negative, our form of jealousy. But Nahum said that God is a jealous, jealous God and a avenging God. There's a scripture, it says, vengeance belongs to the Lord. I know sometimes we want to, you know, we want to rate God. We want to put ourselves above what God says and we want to judge God. But God is a vengeful God. Oh, how can God be so vengeful? How can he take revenge? You take revenge and you do it for wrong motivation. But God isn't like you, like us. When God revenges, he revenges for holiness sake. He revenges on the side of righteousness. Yahweh is not a God that's just a God of love, but he is also a God of justice and anger. We love to talk about the love and the mercy of God, but I want to say something. God is also a God of justice and anger. And let me read this to you. He said, many today want to accept the notion that God couldn't condemn anyone because he is totally love. Nahum says quite the opposite. God does have enemies and God can condemn someone. He is a jealous and avenging God. That may bother some of your theology, <laughs> but the word says it. Nahum taught that the Lord doesn't get angry quickly. Look at verse 3. Nahum 1 and 3. It doesn't come quick. <laughs> That's his mercy. He gets angry, but his mercy doesn't let him strike out at you quickly. His mercy gives us time to repent. If you tell the truth, there were many times you could have been cut off because of your own behavior. But in mercy, God didn't come quickly. It reminds me sometimes of my mama. My mother didn't always spank us. He said beat us the minute we did something. She would hold back. She says, I just want you to know you in soak. She didn't always just strike out and hit you. Sometimes it's not good, parents, to hit your children in anger. You need to wait and calm down. Give them a little mercy. This is the mercy of God, that he doesn't strike us in anger. But he can be angry. Can you imagine what God would do? Oh, if he struck us in his anger? Do you remember the children of Israel in the wilderness and God was ready to wipe them out, but Moses interceded? 
And God, listen, listen. He was going to wipe out Assyria. That's why he sent Jonah. But the people repented. And God gave him another chance. Now, here 100, 150 years later, God says, your time is up. You, you could have stayed in a repentant state. You could have done right. But you chose to go back to your own way. God doesn't become angry quickly. He only does so when he is provoked. God is not a God who wants to be angry, but he does demand justice. And that may be something you have to try to wrap your head around a little bit. Because God has laid down a law and we have transgressed to his law. We've gone against what he said. Oh, y'all know America has gone against God. Come on here. We want to call my aunt sign a song. We're living in the last days where men won't mend their ways. They call them right, wrong, and wrong, right. We're living in the last days. And people don't care about what God said or what God uh, has declared in his word. They don't even want to believe that the Bible is the word of God. But God is still God and he still sits in his heaven. And whether people want to accept it or believe it or not, God has established some things and we turn it around and give it a different name and try to be politically correct with it. But God says sin is still sin and sin must be punished. And we want to say, oh, it's not sin. It's just an alternative lifestyle. Oh, things are so mixed up. I'm thinking about this terminology they're using now. Talk about the they and the them. You know, they and them. You a male or a woman. How you gonna be a they unless you're full of demons? How you gonna be a them unless you got legions of demons in you? You either male or female. Okay. Mm. But we don't want to accept God's way. We want to go about and establish our own righteousness. And Romans says, and because of this, that's why God gave you up to do things that are not common, that are not seemly. Because you don't want to keep God in the picture. And when you want to put God out, we said this so many times ago, there was a time when I was in school, God was included in the curriculum of school. We studied the Bible in school. But when they got rid of God, or so they thought, got rid of prayer. I know you can pray at home, and well, you should. But it doesn't make it wrong to pray in public either. But we allow other nations to come in, other doctrines to come in, other philosophies to come in, and we push God to the corner and think that God's supposed to sit in the corner with a dunce cap on and don't do nothing when you're in his world, breathing his air, living on his time, and God will just sit there and let you do whatever you want to do and get away with it. Sweetheart, it's just not going to happen like that. He's been merciful and he's been just. And he says the time will come. Mm. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. When they just ate and drank and rose up to play. Do whatever you want to do. Ecclesiastes said, remember now your creator in the days of your youth before the evil days come. The day will come when God will get vengeance. Aren't you grateful that he's long suffering and that he's patient? Others endure mockings and, and cruel punishment. But God was patient. They said there was a time when God winked at your ignorance, but now he requires all men to repent. I just want you to know that the time is going to come when God is going to do what he wants to do just like he wants to do it. The book of Jonah shows us this. God gave mercy. God gave time. And now Nahum is saying, God is jealous and he's angry. And he's coming to revenge righteousness. He said, our God is jealous. Nahum also teaches us that God's anger is fierce. Oh, 
It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. <laughs> you think you, you, you get angry and you do something. The anger of God is fierce. Nahum describes God's anger uh, and he says it can be found in the whirlwind and in the storm. Look at verse 6. God dries up bodies of water, flows mountain shape, hills crumble before his anger. The whole earth lies in terror. Nahum says, who can stand before his indignation? It's God's earth, and God can do what he wants to do with his earth. And sweetheart, it doesn't even matter if you don't like it. If God says, I'll shake it, he says, I'll shake it. Mm. Everybody ain't going to like me. But if God says, you don't want to listen to me, I'll shake this whole planet. I'll turn it up on its head. And who's going to do anything about it? I tell you, sweetheart, mm, the fierce anger of God, it's not something you want to play with. I know we want to keep thinking about his love, but I'm telling you, there's another side to this. Bishop said every story got two sides. Every pancake has two sides. There's a loving side of God, and there's an angry side of God. And I don't want to be on the side of, mm, of his wrath and of his anger. Because he's going to pour out his... If you read in Revelation and the bowls and the vials that are poured out on the earth, thank God he'll take us out of here so that we don't have to be bothered with any of that. God may not become angry often, but his anger is fierce and terrifying. And Nahum lets us know. Nahum also teaches us that the Lord protects his remnant. Look at verse 7. While God execute, executes judgment on the wrongdoers, he gives comfort and protects those that are his. Yeah, I know that a lot of good people died during this pandemic. Some of God's children passed during the pandemic. But God still protected them. Some people who have passed away during this pandemic will never see God's face in peace. I'm sorry. Because they never accepted him. And it's sad. People die. And they die without God. And we don't like to think about it. So we want to believe that everybody goes to heaven. But everybody don't go to heaven. Some people will pass from this earth. Wake up in eternity. And not be in heaven. Remember the story Jesus told about the man. The rich man who died he fed sumptuously every day. And the poor man that begged, but they both died. And when a rich man died, the Bible said, in hell, he lifted up his eyes. Sweetheart, there is a wrath to God. There's an anger to God. And when he's giving you every opportunity to repent, but you don't take it, he says, today is the day of salvation. He's merciful to give you another chance. No, I don't think there's any of us who accepted it the first time we heard it. The first time you heard the gospel, you didn't receive it. You procrastinated. You went on about your way. You thought, oh, that sounds good, but you kept doing what you wanted to do. And look how much time God gave you to repent. Oh, I'm grateful. I was raised in a Christian home. 
I went to vacation Bible school and Sunday school. I went to Bible club. My parents made sure of that. Daddy had prayer and taught us the word of God in our home. But I didn't receive it when I first heard it. It was some time. And maybe it was some time before you did. But if you've been hearing the word of God, even from a child, and you heard it until you became a, an adult, and you never accepted it, look how merciful God was to you. He could have cut you off when you were 20, but he let you see 25. He could have cut you off when you turned 25, but he let you see 30. He could have cut you off when you were 30, but he let you live to see 50. He's a merciful God. As a nurse, I witnessed to people on their dying bed and tried to share with them the love of God. And not all of them would receive, would, would accept. But some of them were 70 and 80. Don't you know God was merciful? So if you refuse to accept him, we said it to you last time, if you refuse to accept his payment for your sin, then you have to pay for your own. God protected his people. And that's a wonderful thing because those who pass away in Jesus, they're kept and they're waiting to be joined with us. And the Bible says the trump of the Lord will sound and the dead will rise incorruptible. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Nahum is saying, yes, there is a wrath and an anger and a judgment to God, but he is also a merciful God. And in the midst of his vengeance on those who are wrongdoers, he comforts his own people. And then further, Nahum teaches us that the Lord destroys his enemy. Look at verse 9. None of God's adversaries can rise up against him twice. God says it will not come a second time. They will not come. When God destroys it out of your life, it's destroyed. When God puts it down, it's down. And it will not arise a second time. I hear you, Lynn. It will not arise a second time. God is good. He knows what to do. This is the comfort. When you find out your enemy's coming against you and God says, I'll take care of it. And when I take care of it, believe you me, it's going to be taken care of. They won't come back a second time. This is the message of our world needs that our world needs to hear. God is sovereign, and no one can compete with him. Nobody can compete with him. We have no right to plot against God. <laughs> it's foolishness to plot against God. And if we do try it, he will destroy us. He'll put us down in a permanent way. You know, Satan is running around doing what he wants to do. But his doom is sure. God is going to put Satan under our feet. He says, shortly. There's going to come a day. Oh yeah. After the rapture when the world is going through the turmoil that they're going through, that they will go through, nothing like it. It's called Jacob's trouble. The Lord will return, and there will be a millennium of peace, and Jesus Christ himself will rule, and we'll come back to rule with him. He said, but even after that, look how good God is. Even after that, Satan will be chained Uh but after the millennium, God will release Satan because there will be people 
who will have been born during that thousand year time. And they will have only known peace and goodness and righteousness and Jesus reigning. And they will not have had an opportunity to resist him. I think how good he is. He says, I want you to make a choice. You can choose me. Or you can choose the other side. You can choose the enemy. You can choose Lucifer, Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him. And because he will have been restrained and people would not have known what he was capable of or what he could do, God will release him so that those people can have a right to choose who they want. But ultimately, God says he's going to cast him into the lake of fire and all of it will be cast into hell. God is going to eventually stop this whole thing. He says that there will be a new heaven and a new earth for the former will be passed away. Oh, y'all, we just got to endure for a little while. Things are going to change. They are going to change. And when it changes, I pray you be on the right side. <laughs> so I'm getting on God's side now and staying on his side and praying by the Holy Spirit that I never turn my back on him. I, you know, things can get so hard. I watched the movie a day or so ago and people recanted that they knew God because the punishment was so great. You know, those first century Christians, if you named the name of Christ, you were punished, you were beaten. How many times were the disciples flogged and scorned and beaten and told not to preach in the name of Jesus anymore? But they would not recant. They said, we had better obey God than man. We had rather. So we can't help but to preach what we have heard and what we've seen with our own eyes. Nahum shows us that God keeps his promises. He promised to destroy Nineveh. Look at chapter 2, verse 10 and verse 13. He promised he would destroy Nineveh. And God kept his promise to destroy Nineveh, excuse me, to destroy Nineveh in 612. And I showed you that in the 612, when Nineveh was destroyed, Nebuchadnezzar, with the assistance of the Medes, they took Nineveh. And God had promised that the destruction of Nineveh would come to pass. And Nineveh was so destroyed, was so totally wiped out until the archaeologists didn't find traces of it until 1862. From 612, when it was destroyed, God destroyed them so utterly until archaeologists couldn't find it until 1862. Tell me God don't keep his promises. All you got to, hey, woo, all you got to do is trust him and wait on him. If God said it, he'll do it. If he spoke it, he'll bring it to pass. If God said it, he'll make it good. Whether it's a promise of destruction to your enemies or a promise of blessing to you, God said when he could swear by no other, he swore by himself. Blessing, he said, I will bless you. You got to hold on to God. You got to trust God. You got to believe God. God's going to work it out. It's going to be for his glory, and it'll turn out for your good. Mm. God keeps his promises even today. The promise of scripture will be fulfilled. Those who follow the scriptures will be saved. Jesus will come again. The dead will be judged because God always, you hear me say always? He always keeps his promises. We have find this in Nahum. God will always keep his promise. What he said, he will do. God will never disappoint. My husband says, never disappoint me one day. Since I joined the army of the Lord, he's never disappointed one day. Listen, hold on to God. That's, isn't that a song too? It says, hold to God's unchanging hand. Whatever you do, 
don't let go his hand. Remember his love, his mercy, his comfort. But he also is a God of wrath and anger. And he's a jealous God. He said it in the Ten Commandments. He says, I will have no other God before me. The Lord your God is a jealous God. He will not have any other God before him. We're going to talk a little bit more about jealousy and what it means when God is jealous. Uh, but in the meantime, until we get back together again, I trust the word of God has found you and has made a difference in your life. Good night.